sustained in a Russian missile strike in Kramatorsk, eastern Ukraine, on June 27. Victoria was 37 years old. In Kramatorsk, she was with a delegation of uh, Colombian writers keen to visit the war-affected areas in Ukraine. They were dining together when a Russian missile hit the restaurant. A prize-winning prose writer and poet, founder of the New York Literature Festival in the Donetsk region, since 2022, Victoria Emelina had been documenting Russia's war crimes with the human rights initiative Truth Hounds. She notably uncovered the war diary of the Ukrainian writer Volodymyr Vakulenko, who was abducted by Russian forces in March 2022 and subsequently killed. The diary with Victoria's preface was published in June 2023 and presented at the Book Arsenal Festival in Kyiv just five days before Victoria's death. After the beginning of Russia's full-scale war against Ukraine, Victoria started to write a new non-fiction book in English, War and Justice Diary, Looking at Women, Looking at War. It was supposed to be a collection of stories about Ukrainian women documenting Russia's crimes against Ukraine. Victoria herself was one of these women who was looking for justice for her, her country and for her people. She believed in pan values and supported people whose rights were violated. Now it's our task to continue her work and her fight for justice for Ukraine. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you about Victoria and her story today. My name is Tatiana Teren. I am executive director of Pan Ukraine. Thank you, Tatiana. And for those who joined us for streaming online, there was a pan tradition to open all our events with the empty chair of people who can't be with us from different reasons. Sometimes it's been imprisoned or persecuted. And in Victoria's case, we lost her a couple of months ago. Thank you very much for this heartbreaking introduction of empty chair of Victoria Medina. That was Tatiana Taran, executive director of Pan Ukraine. Thank you very much for being today with us. And uh, this, this empty chair is an introduction to the bigger event. It's an introduction of discussion panel. I do hope this is going to be very insightful. And it's linked with our 89th Pan International Congress under a topic uh, truth of fiction and fiction of reality. Today, we are going to hold two discussion panels. And this is the first one on truth and fiction, writers documenting reality. This is a not the random choice to ask Tatiana to introduce Victoria's case because she was the one literally trying to document the reality of the ongoing war. But our today's guests, and I'm thrilled to announce this list, Probably each one don't really need a big announcement, but also if I would start uh, telling uh, all your bias, we would finish uh, end up our time. Uh, just a few words about each of you. It's Philip Sands, renowned professor of law and director of the Center of International Courts and Tribunals. Christina Lamp, uh, award-winning foreign correspondent and chief foreign correspondent for the Sunday Times of London. Vladimir Yermolenko, Ukrainian philosopher, journalist, and president of Pan-Ukraine, and Mirza Vahid, best-selling author known for his impactful novels on geopolitical issues. Today, we'll be exploring the dynamic intersection of truth and fiction and the influence of storytelling on policy and perception, the role of writers as chronicles of history, ethical challenges, cultural identity in conflict, and the power of fiction to convey deeper truth. Let's see how far we are going to go with this. That's quite ambition, uh, ambitious goal. And I would like probably to start from Philip Sense and uh, use your expertise in international law and in uh, environmental issues and role as a commentator on all those big things. and 
let's start from the question that in your experience, what role can legal mechanism play in holding those responsible for atrocities accountable? And how can writers contribute to this process? You sometimes respond to this question in your book. So probably this is a good chance to start from this point. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you so much, Olya, and thank you for the inter uh, invitation. And I also just want to thank Tatiana. I, I and others were with Victoria just a year ago at the Lviv Book Festival, which some of us are going back to um, in a few days with much sense of solidarity. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to go back. I mean, just to be, let's be blunt about it. Um, Victoria did not just pass away. Victoria was murdered. It was a war crime. It was a crime against humanity. Some will say that it was part of a genocidal act. And these words, these characterizations, these labels, you know, seem to some to be without great significance. But in fact, I think they do uh, have a significance. And one of the things that's happened in this conflict is the connection between what's going on and law has been made very strongly from the outset. It's very different, in my experience, from many other conflicts. Um, and indeed, there is here a link between, I think, writing, in my case, nonfiction, and the direction that the war has taken. As some of you will know, um, a, a day after the war began in on February the 23rd, 2022, the Financial Times got in touch with me uh, and asked me to write a piece about Ukraine and any aspect of international law. And I settled on the issue of the crime of aggression. And the piece that I wrote has generated not only ideas, but also actions from many governments. And we are now on the cusp of the first um, international tribunal for the crime of aggression being established since Nuremberg. That has only happened, I think, in my case of my involvement, because of the books that I wrote, including East West Street, which put Lviv and the territory of Ukraine firmly on the map as, as, a, as a center for juridical um, ideas. Now, in, in writing those books, I wanted the law to reach a broader audience, but I've stuck to nonfiction. Um, and my wonderful editors, in particular in New York, Vicki Wilson and Alfred Knopf, has always caused me to um, hold back from introducing fiction uh, into my books. She, she says to me, Philippe, the moment you do that, the moment you imagine, for example, a conversation between Raphael Lemkin and Hirsch Lauterpacht, the two men who invented the concepts um, of uh, crimes against humanity and genocide, which is so significant today, including in relation to Ukraine, readers will begin no longer to know where is the line between what's true if such a thing exists, whether there are such things as facts, and, um, and fiction. And I'm very focused on this right now, just to conclude. I'm writing the third book in the trilogy, which that draws the link between uh, a man called uh, Walter Rauf, who was a um, senior SS officer uh, and close to Hans Frank and Otto Wechter, who were the main characters in my two previous books, and another man called Augusto Pinochet, you know, the head of state of Chile, uh, who overthrew Allende. And in writing this book, uh, I've encountered uh, many writings on what Walter Ralph, Nazi SS officer, did or did not do for Augusto Pinochet between 1973 and 1977, when, you know, Pinochet was at his most brutal. And what is utterly fascinating is the way in which popular consciousness in Chile and elsewhere about what Ralph did has been informed by works of fiction um, or works of nonfiction, which are very heavily fictionalized. And I find this completely fascinating. Just two examples. The writings of Roberto Bolaño, and in particular Knights in Chile, where Walter Ralph plays a role, extraordinarily. Entirely invented in the imagination of Bolaño, but nevertheless connected to reality, and it's created a myth. But 20 years before Bolaño published Knights in Chile, an English writer called Bruce Chatwin wrote In Patagonia, and almost extraordinarily, Ralph appears right at the end of In Patagonia as chapter 96. Now, with, with Chatwin, we never quite know what's fact and fiction. We know he had this wonderful, I, I don't have any problem with it at all, of sort of inventing some of the conversations that he had. I know that I've now encountered it 
um, as I go around meeting some of the people he supposedly spoke to. But what Chatwin and Bologna did was they placed Ralph at the epicenter of what Pinochet did. And if you talk to taxi drivers in Santiago, they'll say, absolutely. Ralph was involved with Pinochet. How do you know? Well, I lived through the period. How do you know? Well, I read in a book, you know, and then you end up with fiction or some book like Chadwin. But the heart of that issue, of course, is an issue of justice and legal concepts. So this relationship between writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, and what actually happened is for me absolutely central. And you know, you definitely know how to choose your heroes, I should say. And we have a big plans for Chile for the next year. So probably that's going to be a good in our context to learn more about your work. But I was just about to ask, and you probably found your birth way, what legal and ethical dilemmas when you work with this, uh, you know, with this material, when you're like, you're not, it's very difficult to understand you are not documenting, you are using the documented conflict or historical events, right? Or some crisis situation of war. And then how do you navigate those challenges in between this tension on create some dialogues and some mm. facts, probably to make it more mm. juicy fiction, more juicy dialogues and the historical truths, if, if there are any possible solution. <laughs> well, I would say... <laughs> Olya, with difficulty. I mean, I and, you know, Christina and Vladimir and Mirza will have their own views on this. I mean, I'm absolutely um, uh, burdened by the fact that I'm a practicing lawyer. And so, you know, a lot of my life is spent standing up in front of judges and making assertions of fact. And very often the judge will say to you, well, what's your evidence for that? So I've had 35 years of having to support every factual assertion I make, or I'll be torn apart. Now I've got a second life in the last 10 years as a writer, and increasingly reaching that line separates fact and fiction. And I have to say, I'm finding it incredibly difficult to move away from a sort of an evidence-based, but allowing myself to open up um, my imagination. The two main books that I've written on this and the most recent one, The Last Colony, because I'm going so, these are these are works one could say of literary advocacy. I'm trying to push ideas in a particular direction. And for what I'm doing, it's incredibly important for me to be able to say this actually happened. And the difficulty that I have when I come with my new book, Ralph and Pinochet, is in the in that case, Pinochet, the Dina, the intelligence services destroyed all the documents. So all of the cases in Chile over the last 40 years, well, in particular, after Pinochet came back to Chile, they're based on witness testimony. And so I have spent five years talking to people about what they remember from that period. And of course, that is fraught with difficulty because memory is, uh, you know, I'm seeing Christina knowing exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly. Someone, someone, someone I've met told me he was personally tortured by Walter Ralph. I've spent 14 hours with this wonderful human being. Push, I mean, you know, it's very tough to push someone who tells you the horrors that he went through sure. 40, 50 years ago. But, but I've got to be able to say I've tested this out and yes or no. And ultimately for me, but we'll hear from our colleagues, Accuracy is extraordinarily important. And we exactly, you exactly pointed the person who I want to <laughs> ask the next. So, Christina, you have incredible experience. And I personally, I have no idea how you're navigating with all those materials. I remember when we last year, right, presenting your book in Berlin on their body, uh, uh, yeah, our bodies, their but, uh, butterfields. And rereading before presentation, it just gave me a few nights of total insomnia, not because I was reading, just because of all the images brought by your books. And this is incredible about your writing because you document in reality, but in a such a cinematographical way, I would say, probably. But can you share your secret? How do you, how much do you reach to those fictionary instruments 
or how linked is it with, uh, let's say, very straightforward storytelling? Thank you, Olia, and thanks for having me here. It's a great honor to be on this panel and fascinating listening to Philippe as always. Um, I am also remembering, you may not know Philippe, but I actually interviewed General Pinochet when he was in the UK, <laughs> um, which was a rather bizarre experience because I'd literally just come out of hospital that day from having had a baby. <laughs> so the whole, uh, it was a very memorable interview for me. Um, so you're asking a very important question. Um, I, to me, I'm a journalist, I write nonfiction, so I deal in truth, uh, but people do remember things differently. Um, how do I know that people are, are telling me the truth? And uh, I think what I do is I'm a storyteller, so I'm telling the stories of people that I meet in places where terrible things may have happened to them and they don't have a way of getting their story out. So I'm a kind of vessel in a way. And obviously it's important to write in a, a strong narrative, a compelling narrative, if possible, to get people back home to care about things they might not otherwise be interested in. So I guess I'm using sort of instruments that uh, a novelist might write, but not making things up. I'm writing what actually happens to people. I'm using the same kind of instruments in terms of sort of trying to describe things vividly, um, the smells, the sounds, all of that. Um, so I spend, as you know, that book, Our Bodies, Their Battlefields, is about what happens to women in war, the sexual violence. Um, these are really difficult things for people to talk about. I mean, it's the most terrible thing that can possibly happen to somebody, um, very intimate and very traumatizing for them to talk about it. So I worry a lot, not just about the accuracy, but also what am I doing to the person by asking them to tell the story. And as journalists, we're often the first people to meet deeply traumatized people because we're there at the front line or if they're fleeing across borders, we're the people there with notepads often, you know, before they meet anybody else. So I've thought about this a lot because we're not actually trained to, we're not psychologists or anything. We don't know what we're doing and whether it causes damage. So after I had written that book, Our, Our Bodies, Their Battlefields, I spent a lot of time with survivors talking to them about how can we do this in a way that's better? And um, because, you know, many of them will talk about bad experiences with journalists, unfortunately. Um, and so we spend a lot of time because, you know, what they said is we want our stories out. We want people to know, but we want people to know in the way that we want to tell it. It was very important to them always that we don't just focus on the trauma, that we actually present them as people with dreams and hopes and ambitions and, you know, not just the terrible thing that happened to them. I mean, for me because of the way I write I anyway want to do that I want to hear all their stories I'm lucky because I work for a weekly not a daily or sort of 24-hour news service so I tend to have more time to be able to sit with people not every you know many journalists are in a hurry to get this story and I'm sorry to say that in Ukraine, uh, when stories started to be heard about women having been raped by the Russians, I literally saw foreign journalists in the streets running around saying, oh, where's the house of the victim? And, you know, it's kind of um, really, people need to be very sensitive to these things. I personally don't think if a woman wants to tell her story and it's her choice, right, no one should ever, ever be pressured in any way on this. Um, it, it should only be told once, I think. And then, um, so I, for example, one woman had spoken to me because I spoke to her lawyer who told me that this woman would like to tell her story. 
and she only wants to tell it once but the problem was once I wrote it then other people were trying to go and get the story lots of people were contacting me and I was saying look you know she I'm sorry but that's the story as she wants to tell it she doesn't want lots of people it's like you have to realize how difficult it is so there are a lot of issues with this and just circling back to, to Pinochet, so when you may know that Pinochet you know, came to the UK, then uh, was arrested and then was living here under sort of house arrest, which is where I went to interview him. And I was writing regularly about what was happening to him and meeting up with what we called the Pinochetistas who were all staying in Claridge's Hotel, very expensive hotel in London. And I was working for a different newspaper then, the Sunday Telegraph, where the owner of the paper, Comrade Black, actually thought that what Pinochet had done was pretty impressive, that he reformed the pension system of Chile. And yes, he might have tossed thousands of people out of helicopters or tortured people, but probably he, Comrade Black, would like to have done the same thing, was my impression. So... um, So I was in a constant battle because actually when I was at university, I was in protests against Pinochet. (laughs) So when I was writing these stories, every time I wrote about what happens, whatever was going on with Pinochet, always in my first paragraph, I had this line, General Augusto Pinochet, who uh, killed or killed or tortured, I don't know if I remember the exact number now, but something like 3,197 people. Um, and so every week my editor would say, how do you know that? And I would always also quote torture victims in these stories. And then he would say to me, how do you know that the person was tortured? And we would get into these great arguments about, about this. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, it's tricky sometimes. Um, and sometimes, you know, we're living in an age where there are people that even when presented with the the truth don't accept it as the truth so it's complicated that's so true and you just highlighted a couple of things I wanted actually I didn't want to ask but they made me think about that because there are two main issues probably the trust which becomes absolutely universal currency in time of war or any other conflict and aggression right and this trust the victim, or I don't want to use this word, the person who wants to share their story uh, is actually given here. And what we found, and this is an experience also of Victoria and also experience of Volodymyr, I'm gonna ask him next about this. Also experience of the other colleagues of ours who are just going to speak to those people and they are more likely to open up to writers or us as a museum workers, we have this bounded culture project, yeah, in Museum of Terror, they more likely are ready to speak to us than to journalists, just because they feel probably, I don't know, more safe or less traumatized. What what is it? Why do they speak that way to writers? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think with journalists, people feel that they're losing control of their story. So if they're speaking to somebody that is not using it to sort of sell a newspaper, as it were, or um, then they will have more trust. Trust is a very important thing. I spend a lot of time obviously trying to get people to to trust me um, because these are very, very precious things. I felt when I wrote my book about sexual violence, I felt a huge responsibility that these people had trusted me with these terrible stories and it was my responsibility to portray them in in you know the the best possible way and also to to keep you know that book is almost I've sort of become like an activist as well because I it made me very angry the situation and it's happening in so many places and so which is why I wrote the book in the first place, but I also now talk about it a lot in a lot of places and try and get people to care about it and to do something about the issue. 
Yeah, but your case is slightly different because you chose in your past some time away ago, right? So you were prepared. But now I want to turn our conversation to Volodymyr Yermolenko because you, Volodymyr, you just appeared in the middle of everything, right? And you were not prepared the way how, for example, absolutely consciously Christina or Philippe were. And writers are often described as uh, witnesses and chroniclers of history. And but could you? elaborate on the responsibilities and challenges associated with this role because it's very different when you're going to the east of ukraine as a writer just you know with your book and now when you particularly somehow documenting untold stories as well just probably give us a bit of this ukrainian background and context Thank you, Ola. Very glad to be with you, Christina and Philippe, and really eager to meet you in person soon. So, uh, well, I, uh, there is a difference, of course, of people coming into the country from the outside and people in the country. And we can actually see it uh, by the number of books written about this war. So the, the, the number of books from the foreign authors is much bigger than from Ukrainian authors. And you can say you can ask a question why, and I think that there are different layers of it. Uh, the first layer is is um, I think that the major layer is that um, for a person coming into the country, however deeply he or she is connected with the country, and I know a lot of uh, wonderful foreign journalists who are very deeply connected to Ukraine and and have been living here for for years and decades. But of course, it is it is still a certain distance. You you, you have you you do have a right, uh, you you do feel a right to put it into words because when you're putting something into words, you you're having some distance towards it, right? So you you're facing the reality that can be described from the outside. Whereas Ukrainians are, of course, most most of us are inside, and while we are inside. Uh, there are lots of questions you are asking, for example, is it worth it to write at this particular moment or it's worth it to do some other things, to go to the front line, to donate, to, to collect money for, to help the army, uh, to go to the hospital, to, to help the wounded, etc. And I think this is, this is a very important thing. But um, on the other, so, so that we need to understand, and I, I do think that there is a role that that should be a little bit played also by international community, like uh, inviting um, Ukrainian writers and journalists to write more, because it's it's very important that we have these huge voices coming from people coming from the outside, but it should be balanced from the stories about the war coming from Ukrainians themselves. Uh, under under the situation when many Ukrainians, e e including Ukrainian writers, um, are rather struggling with this idea whether it is time to speak, whether it's time to write a novel, whether it's time to write a book. Uh, on the other hand, um, I mean, the Ukrainian culture uh, over, over so much period of time as, as I think many other cultures which can be described in terms of oppression or imperialism or colonialism is of course a culture that in many aspects were silenced, silenced or auto-silenced. And here you come to a very important thing is uh, that language actually, uh, what you say is directly related to your existence. Um, Therefore, for example, the slogan of, of pan-Ukraine is, is a right to exist, but right which is written as, as writing, not, not, a, not as a right, but as writing. It's invented by, um, by uh, uh, Marco Stech and, 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 and his, his partner Tatiana. So that means that in a sense, uh, we have this feeling that if you don't say, you don't exist, but not in a postmodern, you know, way of looking at this, 
as you need to be present somewhere in media, whatever else, but rather in a very existential thing, because if you do not express yourself, if you do not, if you do not say on your terms, then nobody will, uh, nobody will be able to notice you. No, nobody will be able to notice your existence. And I do think that this is actually present not only among writers or journalists, but it's present about uh, people who do not necessarily do this thing. Because what, what surprises us when we travel uh, to the frontline areas is that how people are willing to talk. So this idea that, okay, um, that there is a big trauma and then it puts you into the silence, sometimes it is true, sometimes it is not true. So sometimes this trauma actually opens up people so much that they want to talk so much. And so sometimes we just address by people on the streets that are coming to us understanding that we are we came from a different place with pan ukraine or with uh with other friends and they just start talking and uh, i remember just recently a man came to us in Svetohirsk, um very beautiful town in eastern ukraine and very very much destroyed right now and he just started talking he just started to tell his story and his story was that uh, many of people of his family, even before the big war, they were unable to to take their lives into their hands because of different reasons. Because some of them died, some of them were chronically ill. Um, I think his um, his mother was not able to walk. Uh, his sister or, or wife, I don't remember now, was blind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he. Like when, when you ask such a person, so why didn't you live during these huge battles which took place in the in his place? He says, I mean, there is no chance that I would live because of these reasons, because because I don't have a car, because I, I do have a family members which are uh, which are practically disabled. And uh, and it was not us who, who knew the story and came to him and asked him about it. It was him who addresses us. And there are so many stories like that. So I, I do think I I, um, I fully agree with Christina that we need to be very careful with, with, with people who went to this horrible experience. And uh, I think this is one of the key moral elements uh, of us approaching these people. So we need to think like many many times which questions we ask how we how we ask these questions what we do with the story whether we will publish it like that or with change names or whatever else but the other side of the story is that um, i think our function is that to respond to this um to this willingness to talk and it kind of will be those bridges that connect these people that want to talk with the with the why the world that probably will want to listen. Can yeah. I also just say yeah, yeah. something? So, because we of course depend on interpreters. I don't speak Ukrainian, sadly. I can yes. now, now order a coffee, but that's about it. Um, and so, um, you know, that can be very difficult. I remember once I was on the front lines last year and met this group of these three amazing women who were child psychologists and were actually going to the trenches working as like helping with combat stress. So they were telling me their stories and one of the women was really emotional, she was crying. My interpreter was listening to her and then he'd say to me, she is sad. And I was like, well, yeah, I can see she's sad, but what did she actually say? Oh, sad things, he kept saying. So that was kind of a nightmare. So sometimes, um, you know, we don't, um, we, we are working, unlike you, Vladimir, are actually working through somebody else. So, you know, we can't always get the best. Um, yeah, you have no people. the primary, primary source, yeah. right? You need to have to involve interpreters. That's it, true. And also, what Vladimir was sharing, it made me think about the, how different this experience of uh, ongoing war is different from the events of the Second World War. I remember my grandma who spent some time in the prison in the transfer prison described in a Philip's hands books and to make her speak about anything was totally mission impossible it was it 
it took us as a family about a decade just to get from her some elements of the story. And then we were just trying to put together different puzzles. The actual thing is very different because people became vocal. This war became vocal. You made Myanmar events and Afghanistan events and other vocal. This is a huge difference, right? But then about, it's very important issue what Vladimir just mentioned that what we are doing with the story next. And for me personally, it's a very sensitive question because I'm the person with the bad luck and uh, I have a lot of uh, writer's friends. And when I recognize my bad adventures in their books, sometimes it freaking me out, I should say. <laughs> And I was like, I was just sharing my reality. I don't want to become your material. It can affect our friendship. So this is the very sensitive area and about this human side of things, I would like to invite Mirza to join our conversation. And I, I honestly just started to read your book, uh, her, tell her everything. And Mirza, when I read these things about like, tell, I, di I did it for money, I'll tell her. I was like, yeah, that's the book I'm going to stuck with. And your novel are often exploring the human side of conflict, right? And how in your perspective can storytelling in fiction, these human stories we just discussed with our colleagues, uh, how bridge the gap between political realities, be between uh, historical events and those very sensitive personal experiences? Um, thank you for having me, Ola. And, and it's an honor to be here with, with Philippe and Christina and Vladimir. Um, uh, can I start with the Pinochet story? Because uh, Philippe and Christina both uh, talked about Pinochet. Where I live in London is, is very close to where Pinochet was holed up when he was in the UK. Uh, in Groland's Park, which is a lovely, uh, you know, former stately house. And I've been going to this park for 15, 16 years. And many years ago, my son's nursery was on the other side of the hospital, the priory, where Pinochet was kept as a state guest uh, under arrest, so to say. And I would pass through the, the, the gardens of this hospital. And for 15 years, every time I've gone to the park, and I go there regularly, very, it's a wonderful park, I can't not think of Pinochet because he's there in that big house by the lake. Uh, I'm sure you've sort of all been there. And many times also happened that soon after I remembered this, oh, Pinochet was here, I have gone back home. My mind's gone back also to Kashmir uh, because the mind makes connections immediately. This guy was responsible for a lot of horrors in the 70s and the 80s, you know, as, as Christina mentioned earlier. And then immediately I've gone back home to my childhood and, and Kashmir and people back home and, and the horrors of war we witnessed and so um, Yeah, I thought I should mention my Pinochet story. I was gonna say, you know, when I started writing, I used to think, uh, I remembered for a long, long time, Doris Lessing's uh, line, uh, I think it was her. She said, if I didn't write it, people would think it didn't happen. So that, that impulse drove me for a long time. I was like, okay, all this is happening here. And, and we also, when I was growing up in Kashmir, we also had this version of our reality told by two different sides on the journalism side, which was, there was a version written and broadcast from the, on the Indian side. And there was another reality about us in Kashmir, which was broadcast uh, by, the Pakistani side for Pakistani audiences. And we would say that's not what happened here, you know, for a number of years. And, uh, you know, going back to what I said about Lessing, I felt many in my generation, we wanted to tell our own stories. As Vladimir already mentioned, we wanted to say, oh, this is our story and it's by us. And then of course you choose your form. You know, I was a journalist for a number of years. I, you know, would, what Christina earlier mentioned, you had to do the two minute dispatch or the short report. And I found I couldn't tell my story. Else, you know, 
Uh, or maybe I was just lazy because, as Philippe already mentioned, you have to, it's a lot of work, you know, getting your facts accurate and, and they have to be, you know, backed up. Everything has to be evidence, everything has to be substantiated and so on and so forth. Uh, all those impulses get into uh, writing my first book, The Collaborator, which, um, going back to your question, which is also a personal story in that that's what I saw happening in front of me. Uh, first-hand account, first-hand witness of what happened when I was a teenager growing up in Kashmir. And then later on, you see that uh, I couldn't do justice to that story in a two-minute report or a short essay or, you know, um, or a news bulletin. So I chose the novelistic form because I also, I, I find the novel a very, very mutable, flexible, bendable form. You can do whatever you want to do with it. Uh, and I, you know, and you have delusions of being a writer when you're young. I thought I want to be a novelist. I worked for the BBC for a long time. I couldn't write a novel while I was there. I mean, I did write my first draft while I was still working. But I, I so that's, that was my uh, thing. The other thing I wanted to mention was, I think um, Philippe talked about torture at some point. And when I was growing up, you, you met these people. They were not some special cases or special victims somewhere. There were people you grew up with. They were from the neighborhood. They were from the street, you know, um, next door, or people you went to school with. And when they talked about the violence they had witnessed or inflicted on them, it had become strangely mundane. It had become, it, it was banal because it happened every day. It was part of life. So much so that I will never forget this. I once met someone who actually said to me that he was grateful for not having been killed in custody. And it gets worse, he was grateful to the state, the state that had put him in illegal custody. He was ungrateful to the authorities that I wasn't killed. Because in those days, a lot of people who would be arrested, taken away by the soldiers in, uh, in the early 90s in Kashmir, they didn't come back. You know, they were, they were tortured, they spent years in these dungeons and torture cells and, you know, Ill and most of it was uh, illegal detention, administrative detention, whatever you call it. And those, so those things stayed with me, that how, how does this become so normalized, that this, this guy is grateful, this person is grateful. And a friend who was tortured would talk about torture as if it was like, okay, see, it happens, I have to move on. And um, unspeakable torture, I'm talking about. And when I was, so all those things went into my fiction, the first novel, because I wanted, as I said, I wanted to, I didn't think the news report was enough. It was not, uh, it didn't, it wasn't sufficient for my, for what I wanted to show. I wanted to kind of show the humanity, uh, to, to use a cliche, of the torture victim, of the person who suffered, or of, on the other side, people who are doing the violence, who are doing the violence. I wanted to you know, get into their heads as well. And the novel allowed me that, uh, to, to do that. Um, what was the question, the, uh, one of the other questions? You are the best one. <laughs> I mean, that actually that was the, about how to bridge the gap between political and personal. And you like somehow started responding it. And also we had the comment on the chat about two different truths, how you can merge them. But I, you just said, right, that in the novel, you can put as many truths as you want. And it is, you know, I wanted to talk about what Christina and Philippe both mentioned, the, you know, the, the, the truthness of fiction. Yes. It's very important for me. You know, it, you, it, it's, I mean, novelists, obviously we make up things and so on and so forth, but they have to stand up. They have to work. The world you're creating has to work. It cannot collapse. It has to ring true. You, know? um, you have to examine some, some truths and, and question. You have to ask those questions. You have to pose the question in, in the story. Many years ago, I, you know, in, the, in my first novel, which uh, I had invented a valley. Uh, you know, I'd made up this place where there's lots of dead bodies and corpses because there's a war, you know, on the on the border between India and Pakistan, and a lot of these young men are being killed and dumped into this deep, deep valley. And I had completely made it up, and then I, you know, kind of saw, okay, so if, what if someone goes there to see these people? What if someone also wants to has to pick up things off these corpses? you know, ID cards and weapons and so on and so forth. That's what my first novel is mostly about. It's very grim, you shouldn't read it. 
Um, and many years later, I met a very, very, uh, you know, a brilliant journalist, uh, Muzam Al Jalil, and he said, "Did you know that he has been to one such valley?" In in uh, you know in the borderlands between uh, in, uh, uh, India and Pakistan, Indian Indian Amritsar Kashmir and Pakistani Amritsar Kashmir, and I didn't know this. I was I was a city boy. I grew up in the in, in Srinagar in the city, and I'd seen violence. I said I'd seen my share of the violence firsthand, witnessed it, suffered. Everyone, you know, it was not as I said, it wasn't special, if you want to put that word. It was very very everyday violence, torture, rape, murder. Um, I, I remember we used to have this, there was a, it wasn't a friend, but an acquaintance who I met at a tuition center once. And during a winter, I think it would be 1989 or 1990, it's been a long time, uh, he stopped coming to the tuition center. And, you know, it's, people can drop off tuition centers. In the following spring, we found out that he had been beheaded. So when you grow up in that kind of context, in that kind of world, you, there is trauma, as you know, Vladimir mentioned earlier, then there is this kind of unceasing tension in your head of the storyteller. What do you do with this kind of uh, reality? What do you do with this kind of fact that, you know, there was a kid, he, oh, you, and you don't know this, you just heard that, um, yeah, he was kind of, you know, picked up one day, he had had some connections with a militant organization, and later on, yeah, his body was found somewhere. And so when you have that as, as your, to, to use a horrible term, material as a writer, uh, you, you find ways then to how to deal with it. What do you do with that kind of uh, story? And, and that's where I came from initially. And then obviously I've done another book and another book. And, you know, you kind of also find your place with with you know with, with in both in terms of between the the what is called the artistic impulse and, and you know and the impulse of history and fact you find your place somewhere and it's an ongoing kind of uh, i think i've carried on for too long i'll stop <laughs> no that was extremely interesting because you're sharing this very vivid experience and this is that was actually what we were trying to find and and if we can develop it a bit more that are there any instances, instances where reporting or writing played, let's say, pivotal role in holding perpetrators accountable or, let's say, bringing justice to the victim? Do you can share such cases? And I'm calling to all the panelists to think if you can bring up any stories or any examples or cases of that. Because it's quite clear when you work as a journalist, right? You, you expect some actions to be taken. When you deliver the story as a writer, you basically expect people to feel, to perceive, to process it. But there are no call to actions or I can be mistaken. What do you think? Well, I'm happy to jump in if you if you like. Um, yes, I mean, I think every single book I've written is about a story in which I am in part motivated, apart from the desire to tell a story, is to hold someone or people, a group, to account. I mean, you know, I spent a long time as an academic. My first books were all academic books but then the first one that I wrote that, that took a different line for a broad audience a trade book was called Lawless World and it was essentially about Iraq and it mm. was the book that uncovered purposely it's what I was looking for it's what I wanted to write about the true story of how the British Attorney General had changed the legal advice that he had given in the space of 10 days from saying no you can't do this lawfully to yes you can do it lawfully and that book, um, you know, I'm, I don't want to overstate the impact that it had, but it set the narrative. People suspected people, but people wanted documents. And in writing that book, I had access to someone who had the documents, who showed me the actual legal advices. And I was able to track the changes and write about them in an accessible way. Um, the upshot of that, of course, is that the gentleman concerned refuses to be in the same room as me at any place anywhere if we're at the same conference which I find very entertaining along with the former wonderful legal advisor Elizabeth Wilmshurst who 
had the courage to resign from the Foreign Office. And his reputation, I'm very glad to say, is deeply marked, not by allegations or rumours, but by the fact that we've got documents in black and white. And the same thing went for um, another book that I wrote called Torture Team, which dealt with um, one of the Bush administration lawyers who personally drafted the techniques of interrogation. You know, we're talking a lot about torture today. And I, again, met people who, you know, Christina and others know even better than I how to do this, how to get people to talk. But people actually want to talk and they want to show you things and get things off their chest or whatever. And so I was shown the actual documents. Um, and the theme that runs all the way through it for me is my focus on lawyers, a, often a very scurrilous bunch. Um, and and lawyers, I think, have a particular social responsibility in life. And the independence and the integrity of the lawyer is absolutely crucial. And one rather like journalists and the writer, once that's gone, it's over. Yeah. You're finished. You can't ever bring it back. And in the relationship of those two lawyers, I think their reputations were deeply affected by the simple publication of a book. I'm not an investigator. I'm not a judge. I'm not a prosecutor. Words really, really matter. And I come back and I'm fascinated. I really now need to come and speak to Mirza. And Christina, we're going to have three days to talk about Pinochet and Lviv. I'm thrilled to be able to interview you um, <laughs> about that. But it, but people, um, you know, are really marked by words that can change things. Bruce Chatwin and Roberto Bolaño created a narrative that has stuck and that imposes a real responsibility. That's, I think, the common words that the four of us are, are, are sharing, the responsibility of the writer, because words actually can change the world. Mm -hmm. Now, we had a very funny conversation before setting up one of the discussion panel, and we were like, look, if we'll invite the lawyers or human rights activists, they're going to speak in a quite... Uh, narrow way because they are limited with their terms right when we invite writers the horizon of discussion became widener <laughs> because and this is the thing we were talking what is their responsibility actually maybe sometimes to provoke thinking right or christina maybe you have some stories from your very rich uh experience when I don't know, storytelling led to tangible policy changer or obviously increased awareness. This is not for discussion, yeah. but like actual changes. So I think, you know, most of us as foreign correspondents have this kind of idealistic view that what we write can change the world, right? That we all write things that will cause public to be outraged and uh, Martha Gellhorn used to talk about public opinion as like a flight of angels that would then um, put pressure on authorities to end injustice. In fact, in practice, that rarely happens. Um, and people often ask me, how could you do this job? You, you spent all your time in bad places where bad people were doing bad things. And I always say, actually, the hardest thing about it is, is that, that it actually isn't being in those bad places or being in danger or being in uncomfortable places. It's the frustration that it doesn't make a difference. And I think the hardest thing I find to deal with is like, for example, one of the young Yazidi women telling me her story about being taken by ISIS fighters as a sex slave and held. Um, and afterwards, when I'd written her story, she sent me a message, a WhatsApp, because we all stay in touch these days with WhatsApp, saying, I told my story, what difference did it make? And I couldn't answer that question. And I felt terrible because actually, yeah, I can say, well, it made people more aware. But, you know, the fact is, it's almost 10 years, the UCDs are still in horrible camps in Iraq the ones that have escaped, others have still never been found. And, you know, did it really make a difference? In a way, that's why I ended up writing this book about rape in war, because I couldn't understand why 
people were coming forward, telling their stories in large numbers. Um, nobody was being prosecuted. Um, so in that case, all I could say is I hope I spread awareness and I keep talking to people about it. Um, cases where it has made difference. I mean, they're like small things you do. Sometimes I remember writing about a, a man who discovered a way to make roundabouts in South Africa for children that also, he basically had converted circular motion into vertical motion. So if kids went on this roundabout, it pumped water up. So he turned these roundabouts into water pumps. And in villages where people were, mostly the women usually, were having to walk three hours each day to get water, this actually completely changed their lives. So I thought this is wonderful, Thing. So I wrote about it and a woman happened to read the Sunday Times who had just lost her son tragically. His name was Lawrence and he'd had a rare disease and he died very young. And she was looking for some way to remember him and she read this story. So she set up a project called Lawrence's Wells and raised money and actually installed these wells all over Africa. So they actually help lots of people. So things like that, I mean, make you feel um, at least something's happening. And then there have been stories in terms of policy. So for example, when the British troops went into Helmand in um, Afghanistan in 2006, and we were all told that this is a reconstruction project that the defense secretary said he hoped they wouldn't fight a single bullet. And I was the first journalist to actually be embedded with the British troops on the ground there. And what I found once I was with them and we went out to the village, we were um, immediately surrounded. We were ambushed. We had to run for our lives for hours. We were very lucky to get out. Um, and we couldn't get, I mean, we were, there were 45 of us, uh, soldiers and me and one photographer completely surrounded by Taliban firing on us. The commander contacted the headquarters asking for air support for helicopters and was told that there's nothing available because there's so much fighting going on elsewhere. So it became very clear so that this was not just some kind of reconstruction project. So when we finally got out, which actually we ended up having to spend the night in the desert, we couldn't go back because there was only one road. We finally got out. And I wrote the story and the Sunday Times put it on the front page and wrote, you know, this is war, this is not. Mm -hmm. And that actually told people for the first time that what these soldiers were doing was not some kind of free construction, but were fighting for their lives. And, um, and that made a lot of difference because then it raised questions in parliament, more um, helicopters were sent, more weapons. Now, whether overall that actually achieved anything, given that the Taliban now running Afghanistan is a, another question. But mm -hmm. it, it certainly made a difference at that time to those soldiers. Um, and for a while, I kind of was endlessly then being contacted by soldiers on the ground telling me, we haven't got enough boots or we're completely under siege in this place. And the Ministry of Defence blacklisted me because they, they were, it was driving them mad that we were running all these stories. So they actually refused to let me in bed with any other British soldiers for some years after that. Yeah, when you get blacklisted in such a country, <laughs> it definitely means that you are making a difference. This is a total proof. Mirza, you have your hand uh, raised and I also have one more question for uh, Volodya and then we can switch to the audience questions. We already have some. No, I was going to say, I'm glad Christina did write the Zidi woman's story because the, the, what, is, what are the options? So uh, yes, maybe we haven't seen any immediate action or immediate accountability, but what, what does, you know, Philippe, when she mentioned the word responsibility comes to mind again, you would rather speak than not. You would rather write than not, you know, because as we discussed earlier, everything starts with the word. The word has to be spoken. The word has to be written. The idea of change or resistance or accountability or responsibility or something ultimately landing in an international court of justice or in front of a judge, everything will start with the word, which has to be spoken by a writer, by a lawyer, by a novelist, by a poet. I was going to mention, because you know your question earlier, what does it mean? What does it do when things are written, whether in uh, 
fiction or non-fiction or journalism or you know reportage uh they have to be there we have had two major uh, investigations and reports into what happens what happened and what happens continues to happen in kashmir one in every one in six kashmiris has faced some form of torture but that's a staggering number and this is not me this is medicine source frontiers a few years ago they did an in-depth investigation one in six kashmiris has faced some form of torture it was at one point it was endemic it was widespread it was like a disease so to speak the other thing i wanted to mention was many years ago uh, a human rights group in kashmir uh, and the 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 convener and the director and the main person behind which is is in, in, in prison now khuram parvez i must mention him his organization along with uh, help from un rapporteurs for human rights it carried out an investigation into the mass graves of kashmir so there are these graves unmarked graves in the mountains of kashmir which my first novel deals with in the, in a fictional way and they found out these uh, graves and they went and they you know did carry out uh, uh, an investigation and and wrote a very very uh, brilliant and in-depth and report which basically and with photographic evidence there are these mass graves in the mountains of kashmir the report is there it's then which then resulted in the un unhcr doing its first in-depth investigation into what happens in kashmir which was published recently a few years ago it was of course dismissed by the indian state uh, as oh yet another human rights report by the un but it was the first major piece of work done by an international body there has been no accountability i must say that for all these things so as i said there's torture and 50% of the population in kashmir suffers from some form of ptsd 50% and women more than men so every other woman every second woman in kashmir has a form of ptsd and suffers from them. so all these things are there documented in that un is in dominance investigation um rafter foundation and kashmir's main uh, human rights group called uh, coalition of jammu and kashmir civil society which uh, as i said the, the, it's been kind of you know um, its work has been stopped by the indian state but those reports exist and i would rather they do exist you know going back to what kushina said that they have to be there for some form of accountability some form of reckoning to happen at some point yeah. thank you very much that was very valuable you know picturing of the reality of the situation because you never can sense it so good when you have it from the primary witness or primary source or through the writing. And here is a question to Volodymyr, uh, actually about the relationship between literature and identity, and particularly in the context of Ukraine. Uh, because now, like we were talking a lot about the external purchasing for the story, and you are from the other side. How can writers address challenges identity during times of war. I think this in Ukraine is especially sensitive right now also in terms of the all the big cultural changes too. Thank you, Ola. I was afraid that you're you are going to ask a question about Pinochet. And, uh, <laughs> I knew that. We we'll leave it for Lviv. <laughs> the, the only person on the panel who has nothing to say about about this uh, story but look uh i wanted to jump in on on uh, on those questions that that, that were raised and, and very importantly because on the one hand of course we need to speak and uh, we need to talk and we we need to witness and um, and give evidence on the other hand we, we need to also see the limitations our limitations we need to be aware of them uh for example like writers who are documenting uh, and who are documenting uh, war crimes, and I will, I will refer to to Victoria Madam in this respect, because um, as with Titana, we also were uh, close friends, and I just looked into uh, her way of of doing things. And at a certain moment, uh, she stopped. She she's a novelist, and at a certain moment, she stopped writing novels. And started doing two things documenting war crimes in a very legally you know strict procedure because to, as we know documenting war crimes and just reporting are just two different two different things 
uh, they need to uh, abide by different norms. They, 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 these are two different professions. But at the same time, she started writing poetry uh, instead of prose. And uh, uh, we were actually at Penn Ukraine, we were inventing new genres uh, in, in this war as well by connecting poetry uh, to music. And uh, what I realized at some point that her poetry was a, also a documentary poetry. Mm -hmm. Like, can you imagine a documentary pro poetry? Because it seems to be that poetry is something, you know, very, very different. And uh, because her poetry was born out of her conversations with people, with women, uh, with, with men, with kids. And I think this is a very important thing to, to, to remember, because imagine a, a legal report out of a war crime. Will a person who suffered a war crime recognize herself or himself in this report? Obviously, no, so, because it, this report will, will provide facts, very important facts, and probably there will be accountability, but it will not contain lots of, lots of very, very important things. The, the internal experience, emotions, and all, all what, what you feel in this way, etc. And another question which I'm asking, for example, is, is if we do oral history of, of war crimes, is it a documenting? Is it a document when you just put a microphone and listen to a person, and this person tells you uh, her story? Uh, it's is it a document like in in a strict sense of the word or rather it is something different because what you want to fix in in this oral history just a recording is rather this very deep level of experience that this person came through and here uh, because at the, at the first stages of this big invasion i had lots of writers saying we have nothing to write in terms of fiction. We we cannot write it because the 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 reality was much more much stronger, much more gruesome, much more cruel, much more vivid than anything you invent. But then I'm asking a question. For example, when you talk to to, to different people, I will remember for all my life when I talked to a, a man uh, from Izum. Uh, who lost seven members of his family in one bomb strike. And not only he, he lost, including three children, not only he lost them, but actually the moment when he got to their bodies uh, was uh, a month or more after the strike. Because of the war, because of, uh, you know, uh, it was a big, big building in Izum, five-story building, and all of them, it was a Russian bomb strike, very cruel. Uh, all these people were in the bomb shelter, and despite that, they were killed, and the, 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 there, was, there could be no rescue work, and just the work to excavate the body started one month after. So how can we tell this story? I, I don't think we can, we can even invent anything as... As, in, as a fiction, because you really need to go into this. And of course, you will say certain inaccuracies. And of course, probably a character will, will not recognize himself in that. And of course, probably you will add imagination. But maybe this is uh, what uh, Maria Vargas Llosa called when he said, this is a truth through lies. So I do think that there is there is a very strange uh, connection between fiction and non-fiction. And sometimes just pure facts cannot tell you the full story. Uh, and uh, you cannot really go into the deep emotions uh, unless you in invent something, and unless you write, write fiction. And on your question about, about identity, yes, of course, there, there is this... Um, this quest for identity in Ukraine, because we need to understand the kind of, and I try to explain it all the time, the, some peculiarities of Russian imperialism compared to some other imperialisms is that they do not, the Russian imperialism is, is not really dealing with the bodies, with the question of body, of race, of color, of skin, et cetera. It's, it's, it's rather a question of assimilation. So the the powers the, the power structure are, are not performed through the idea of difference, like you are the different than me, I'm higher than you, etc. But rather through the idea of sameness, 
you will never get a chance to be different from myself. This that's the this imperialist logic, a little bit different. And of course, the how Ukrainians react to it, they say, no, we are different and we have a right to be different and we have a right to our language, our speech, uh, our culture, etc. And this is all very important. But at the same time, we would not limit what Ukrainians are doing uh, to the question of identity. It's far, far broader than that. If you listen to Ukrainian poetry right now, it's very universalistic. So you can recognize yourself in this because... This, if you look at Ukrainian films or, or, or music or, or, or theater uh, or philosophy, uh, I, I think the, the questions that people are asking are not only the questions of identity. The, the questions people are asking, what does it mean to be next to death? What does it mean to be in a situation when you can lose your beloved person next day or you, you already lost it? These questions of mortality, this question of fragility, these questions of a loss, the questions of distance, the question of losing a home. I mean, these are universal questions, which I, I hope every person on earth can understand. And, and, and this is, I think, this is what Ukrainian culture right now, Ukrainian literature right now uh, is uh, going to tell and is telling the world. Thank you so much. That was so such a deep response that it just like gave me <laughs> the goosebumps sometimes. And I think that this is a real what the storytelling is about. We have one question in literally two minutes to wrap it up. We have a question from Sri Lanka. And um, Patnam says that our country also endured a 30 year long war. And in the context of war reporting, where the lines between fiction and reality can sometimes blur, how can journalists and writers, and most of you are both in one, strike a balance between convening the emotional and human aspects of war while maintaining the journalistic integrity of their narratives? Like what ethical consideration should be taken into account when blending all those elements of storytelling with factual reporting and then sensitive film? I think that most of you already responded to this, but probably the very short, just the sense of it, when, 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 probably, Philippe, let's start from you. You are the most experienced at juggling your different hats. It, it's a really wonderful and very complex question. And for me, it goes to the issue of what is my identity when I'm putting words on a page? Am I writing as a lawyer? Am I writing as a writer? Am I writing as a human being? We all have multiple identities. And there is a conflict, plainly, in my two lives, writing as a lawyer and writing as a writer. And my instinct in answer to your question is that the function of the writer, not the lawyer, not the journalist, is somehow to open the imagination and to allow the reader to obtain a sense of what is happening. And I think it's entirely appropriate and right to, in doing that, cross a line and depart from the precision of what someone told you in an interview. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly facing this. I record all my interviews. And to what extent can I permit myself a modest change of the use of a word or a pause in giving an account or putting it another way to what extent can I permit myself to say you know perhaps I haven't accurately heard that person and that gives me some leeway but the answer to your question differs if I'm making the argument before a group of judges I go one way if I'm making the argument for a writer for a reader I'm going another way. Uh, and I, I think that's how I would answer that question. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Christina. Yeah, it's a very good question. Look, I mean, facts obviously matter because if, if you don't get the facts right, then that undermines everything that you're doing. So uh, um, to me, integrity is everything, you know, but it's also important we care. And I don't know, maybe it, 
when I started out as a journalist 35 years ago, it felt like the world was sort of going in a right good direction. It was, you know, the Berlin Wall had just come down, dictatorships in Latin America were ending. And um, now it feels the other way. Right? It feels like democracy is on retreat, even in countries like ours with long established democracies. We've realized you can't take democracy for granted. Um, and a lot of bad things are happening and a lot of the wars I cover never seem to end. Um, so, you know, I often find myself feeling shame as a journalist about things that I'm covering and wondering, are we doing enough? I take Afghanistan as an example. You know, it is absolutely heartbreaking to see the Taliban back in power there and women and girls not being able to work. It's the only place on earth where girls can't go to school. It's been more than two years that they haven't been able to go to high school. And yeah, the world sort of expresses their outrage and I can write pieces about how terrible it is, but at the end of the day, nothing has, is happening. So like I said, I feel shame as a journalist, shame as a woman, shame as a mother. So now I've become a bit more activist than I used to and I write you know, I don't, in what I write, I'm still just presenting what people tell me and leaving it, well, I say leaving it up to the reader to judge, of course, the way that you present it, you are leaning towards one way or other, but I talk much more at things now about situations to try and, and get people to actually wake up and feel that, I just feel like, you know, we've started accepting a lot of things, the fact that Bashar Assad in Syria is still there and is now, you know, trusting around the world to various international conferences. Having personally witnessed what his forces did in Aleppo, I find absolutely unbelievable. And yeah, so I've become a bit angry about things. Well, definitely answer your anger and <laughs> the will to speak more, inviting you more often. Thank you for that. Mirza, what is your response? I think, you know, we, Christina and uh, Philippe both mentioned this. It's, it's a question of responsibility again. What are you, what you're doing? Are you doing everything in your power to portray a truth as closely as possible? Do, you know, as a novelist, sometimes you think that my job is to reduce the gap between the thought and what's put, what goes on the paper. It's a struggle always, always a struggle because it's never really perfect. You know, what you have imagined uh, the previous night, next day, when you put it down on paper, it's not, it's not the same thing. But I think I work towards reducing this gap all the time. And that gap also means reducing the gap between what the person is reading out there. Have I done my best? Have I been responsible to the story? Have I, am I committed to the story fully? Am I, really, really doing my job well in terms of that's the reality. In whatever form I write it, whether it's a non-fiction account or fiction or a story or a poem, as Vladimir mentioned, am I doing justice to the story is where I look at it. Am I, am I doing justice to the story? You know what I think about it. I, say, you know, I was in Palestine recently for the, for the festival, for the Palestine Festival of Literature. And um, something Vladimir mentioned, which kind of brought back that memory. I saw a play by a young uh, playwright, uh, Khala Ibrahim, which was uh, titled A Knock on the Roof. And now we've all read reports for years, decades about bombings. You know, Israeli jets going to Gaza, bombing a house, bombing a residential neighborhood, so on and so forth. And we all sort of seen them on TV. But this play brought that because it's a play about a woman negotiating the bombing. What does she do? when there's a knock on the roof, which is the pre-bombing knock that arrives at a Gazan house, for instance. You know, when they send a small warning first that you have five minutes or 15 minutes to leave basically everything and run. She dramatized this and I will not forget it. It was, the you know, despite having reports, read reports all my life, she dramatizes what does, what goes through her mind when she kind of wants to leave the house with her child because the bombs are coming. You know, so that's kind of the power of, of, of fiction, which kind of, you know. Uh... Yeah, yeah, that's very deep. Thank you very much, Volodya. Yeah, but I think that uh, I, I agree with, with, with my friends and colleagues. Um, and let, let's remember the classics. I mean, 
There are some times we need to come back to the classics. Uh, what Aristotle said about the drama, what, what is the, the goal of it is catharsis, but how, how we understand this catharsis actually. For my, me personally, what art is doing is that it invites you to feel, to, to go through experience you, you didn't go or you don't go right away. Uh, or, or you did go sometimes in the past, but you, you forgot about it and you live it again. So actually the art and literature is inviting us to live some different lives than we are living. Okay. And uh, can journalists, journalism do that? Yes, I think it can as well. Uh, because when, again, coming back to this idea of oral history or just interviewing people, just let them speak or what the good documentaries are doing without this really voice that uh, it tells you what to think, but but really lis listening to the people. So I think these are different, different ways of... Uh, of of doing that, of feeling uh, the pain of others, the joy of others, and we just need to need to understand that there is big work, and that it's it's not only about accuracy, probably about something else. Just one one clear example is that if you make a book about Ukraine, of photos about Ukraine. Uh, made up only from the photos about the war, you will be accurate because these are the accurate places, but you will not be really true because there are so many things going on except for the war, right? So it's also the, the question of selection. And just one thought about what Christina said. I think it's actually good that when journalists became activists because uh, we are all citizens, we are all humans and we recently had a conversation with Tim Snyder in Kiev and he said a very interesting thing that all Ukrainians he talked to uh, uh, have a feeling of guilt and uh, I understand him very much uh, I do think that this is uh, the, but the feeling of guilt or shame as Christina said is also a kind of a, a feeling of responsibility why we are feeling this guilt because we understand that we need to do some more we can do some more something more and this is also a good human feeling, I think. So we, we rather need to work with it and turn it into the good actions. You know, I actually hate the panels when everyone agrees is with each other. <laughs> it feels like we didn't come to something you know, new horizon. But you made me think uh, two weeks ago, I got the task to write a review for a book. You actually were writing the intro for the loss of Alessia Kromachuk. And I would talk to my, uh, my uh, therapist, say, asking like, how should I respond to this task as a lawyer, as an activist, as a philosopher, or as a Ukrainian, or as a person like based in the UK? How should I merge all those, you know, hybrid identities? And she said, you know what? Just write it as a human. Mm. And this is what I did. <laughs> now I have more recipes from you. <laughs> Thank you all so much. That Olya, you can I just, just come in just on one thing? Because one of the Please. things that has excited me about this conversation, I've been, you know, writing this bloody book about Pinochet and Ralph for about five years. And, you know, we all have this feeling you sort of write about things and actually at the end of it, you think, oh, my God, nobody cares. And and I'm very excited that, you know, Christina and Mirza have got their own Pinochet experiences. And then I've gone <laughs> to the chat and 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 Herman Rojas has, 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 has expressed gratitude. So let me just, apropos your last question, just leave you with one anecdote, since we are all writers. And how do, you know, I'm struggling with how to deal with the situation. I've come to know the interpreter who accompanied the um, Scotland Yard officers into room 801, in which um, Mr. Pinochet or General Pinochet or Senator Pinochet was lying when the knock came on the door and they entered um, and informed him that he was being arrested for genocide and crimes against humanity. And um, he was, as you can imagine, quite shocked, but he didn't speak any English. And so they needed an interpreter. So this wonderful lady who really is straight out of central casting, fantastic character, went in, told me the whole story with absolute crystal clear memory. 
Um, and his the first thing Pinochet said when being told he was under arrest for mass murder um, was, I know the fucker that's behind this. It's Garces. So Garces is actually, was Allende's advisor and lawyer who orchestrated the legal proceedings in Madrid that led mm -hmm. to the arrest warrant. But the judge who actually issued the request for extradition was not called Garces, he was called Garzon. Mm -hmm. And the relationship between Garces and Garzon in terms of words is obviously a very close one. And with the passage of time, it's become apparent that it's not entirely clear what exactly Pinochet said. Was it that fucker Garces or was it that fucker Garzon? And I've had two completely conflicting stories uh, with both people absolutely digging in their heels and then saying they're absolutely certain that it was Garces or it was Garzon. Now, in those circumstances, what is a lawyer to do and what is a writer to do? Uh, and I think the answer to that question is, is different. And I'm struggling with quite how I deal with this. It's an essential fact, as you will see when the book eventually emerges. Um, and that, I think, encapsulates very much of the conversation that, that, that we've been having and that I think I've certainly been so enjoying. Thank you so much, Olya, for your wonderful uh, organization of the conversation thank you that you know, that, that's never <laughs> enough time right that we have here with us philip sands christina lamb Voldemarie romolenko and mirza vahid and i really hope to thank see you. you all very soon and <laughs> thank you our uh, audience we are taking a three minute break and we just closed the uh, uh, panel on truth of fiction and we are reopen on a fiction of truth that's going to be very exciting please stay with us <laughs>